Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Life. We're about to stand. We're going to sing this morning. So bad morning to sing. Some bad morning when this life is over. I You can have a seat. Stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> what does the law say? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
<laughs> right. All right. Do this and you will live. Wait. The man then asked, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. Ah! They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Another man who worked in the temple who was called a Levite walked over and looked at him lying there. Uh, huh? But he also passed by on the other side. Then a Samaritan came along. Uh. Samaritans were hated by Jews. They were seen as lesser people, and Jews would not interact with them. But when the Samaritan saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. One room, please. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Amen. And children are going to be learning that this morning in their classes. Our little ones are already in their classes. And grades one through six, you're going to be dismissed in just a second. But we want to remind you. It's been a little bit of a break, and everybody's excited. This Wednesday night, our Olympians ministry kicks off again. Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8 p.m., all right, for children grades uh, ages 4 uh, through grade 5. L.A. and Emily are leading that endeavor. Would you just raise your hands for us, please? Let's give it up for these guys. Getting ready to kick off again. It's exciting. And uh, so children, grades 1 through one through 6, you guys can be dismissed at this time to meet your adult leaders in the back and head to Promised Land and the rock. And as they're being dismissed uh, this morning, I just want to say welcome to New Life. It's good to see you this morning, and it's good to be here this morning. And I want to thank you for all the kind uh, emails and uh, text messages and uh, just phone calls even. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, just so you're aware, uh, some people have asked, you know, number one, am I clear to be here this morning? My doctor did clear me to be here today and to do what I am doing. But I had a, a little bit of a scare last week and a routine eye exam, and they said, we want to just kind of bolt a couple things down. Let's do that now. And I wasn't uh, cleared to preach last Sunday. And dad is, and mom are in Florida, and, uh, and they are suffering for the Lord, walking in sand as we are shoveling snow today. Uh, but I have a, a good friend, Dr. Rock LaJoya, who you heard last week. And outside of my own father, he's probably one of the most influential men in my ministry life. Uh, he mentored me all the way through my doctoral program and uh, has become just a mentor in the face. So hopefully that gave you a good window into uh, some of my training and just uh, where I come from, educationally speaking, uh, with Dr. LaJoy. What a great message too, right? Do not worry. Man, how applicable. He didn't even know that he was tying right in with our series as we look at the life of Christ. And man, what just an awesome, awesome message. And uh, I appreciate him in so many ways. Um, but I just want to say welcome to New Life. And maybe it's been a while since you've been with us, or maybe this is your first time. And we would like you to know that if it's been a while, or maybe this is your first time, um, we would like for you to stop by the Welcome Center. Just let us know that you're worshiping with us today. And we'd like to bless you with this coffee mug that on a cold winter morning you can sip some hot coffee, 
some hot tea, some hot cocoa, whatever you choose to be your hot beverage of choice, go ahead and grab a mug. We want to bless you with that today. And uh, there's some chocolates in there as well for you. But we're just glad that you're worshiping with us today. And if you don't get our electronic um, email with our newsletter in it, we would encourage you to sign up. You can do that by letting us know, send an email to the church and say, hey, make sure my email's in there. Maybe you are signed up. It might be going to your spam folder or something. Check that too. Uh, But we can make sure that we know if we're sending it to you, but make sure you get that. If you don't, um, and you still don't want to receive the electronic email, that's okay. There's a hard copy on your way out the door. You can grab that and see what's happening here at New Life. Uh, yesterday was our jump in Java, uh, Friday and Saturday. Was, yesterday was pretty, an, a pretty amazing day. Our area lost power. AEP went down around the church. This is what happened. 11 a.m., we lost power in most of the church except about three outlets in the gym and about four lights. Amazing, right? Amazing. And so they were able to finish the how they were able to finish the jump and java yesterday at 2 p.m. They killed the, the switch, they pushed the off buttons for the bounce houses. They deflated. No sooner had they deflated and the rest of the power went out. We lost the power in the gym. We lost it was like the Lord's hand was on our day so that parents could fellowship together, kids could play. It was a wonderful time. Uh, but there's some different events on here that are coming up you'll want to make note of. For instance, uh, Hour of Power is coming up in a few weeks. Um, uh, the uh, Power for Living Academy is coming up in just a couple of weeks. That's going to be kicking off our winter quarter there. Uh, we have a Next Step seminar on February 20th. Maybe you've been visiting New Life or maybe you're interested in getting to know more about New Life. We'd encourage you to register for the Next Step seminar, February 20th. Uh, you can find out information about how to do that right here on this paper as well. Or you can just stop by our Welcome Center and say, hey, I want to get into that Next Step seminar. Tell me how to do that. And we welcome you to do that. But we're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Would you join me as we ask the Lord to bless us as we worship him? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We pray that you would be glorified as we uh, worship you this morning in song. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified as we study your word this morning. And Lord, I pray that as we go out and live for you, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, we would bring glory and honor to you as we represent Christ to all that we come into contact with. Lord, if any don't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that this morning they would see you. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we continue to sing? And as we sing this morning, we've got a new song to sing. It's called Firm Foundation. We introduced it uh, last week as a special. It's based on the scripture, Matthew 7, 24 through 25, which says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Christ is our only firm foundation. He's never failing, he's never changing, he's always faithful, and he's always good. Derek's gonna lead us in this song as you uh, sing as you catch on to it. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations so why would he fail now? He won't. Oh, he won't. But I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be
As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I want to remind you, you can give one of three different ways. You can give in the offering uh, receptacles in the lobby. You can give online, nlpositivefaith.com. Click on the giving link uh, and follow the prompts there. You can also mail in an offering, P.O. Box 228, Osceola, Indiana, 46561. We're so thankful uh, for your contributions to help get the gospel out, not only here in our community, but around the world. And if on your way out, you may want to grab one of these forms if you haven't already. It'll share with you just a little bit about how the resources are used um, here at New Life, in our community, and then also around the world for Jesus Christ. Also some good prayer points as you go into 2022 on how God is using New Life and our work together for the gospel ministry. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me this morning? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you with our tithes and our offerings. Lord, we pray that you would bless both the gift and the giver. Lord, we pray that you would, in this time, you would use these resources here at our church, use them in our community. Lord, take them around the world for Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm 
moving in And no matter where I go And no matter where I've been I will see your goodness, Lord In the land I'm living in Amen. I will see your goodness in the land that I'm living in. We would lose heart if we did not believe that we would see the goodness of the Lord in the land that we're living in. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to pray for Pastor Mike and Cindy this morning, Mom and Dad. I just want to pray that the Lord refreshes them in their time away and prepares them for more service here when they come back. Lord, I just pray that as we open your word this morning that you would speak to each one of us, encourage us and equip us. Lord, I pray for Pastor Mike and Cindy. I pray that you'd give them a refreshing time away. Lord, bring them back safe to us and re- prepared for another year of service. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A New York City businessman decided he was going to avoid a $20 service fee to replace his light bulb in his office. And he thought, I can do this on my own. I don't have to pay 20 bucks to get this thing done uh, by the maintenance crew here. I'll just bring in my own fluorescent bulb. So he did the measurement. He said, okay, I need about a seven-foot uh, fluorescent bulb. And so he went out. He got himself a seven-foot fluorescent bulb. And he thought to himself, well, the problem is not getting the fluorescent bulb into the office. It's how do I dispose of the one that's in the office. How do I get that out and then dispose of it correctly? And so that was his dilemma. And on his way home one day from his commute, uh, he got off the subway and he was walking down a couple of blocks. He saw a construction dumpster and he thought, boom, there it is. All right, I just got to get the seven foot fluorescent bulb in. I can change it out and on my way out, uh, on my way home, after I get off the subway, I can just drop it in this construction dumpster. That's an appropriate place to dispose of this bulb. All right, good deal. So he makes his plan. He gets in. He replaces the bulb. He's avoided his $20 fee. He's so happy. And on his way home, he gets on the subway and he gets, he takes that fluorescent bulb. It's the old one. And he stands it end to end. He's about, he's, you know, he's standing there. And if you've ever ridden the L train in Chicago or you've been on the subway and New York City or something of that nature, public transportation, you know it eventually quickly fills up and he's standing there and he's holding this fluorescent bulb end to end vertically and he's holding it and the train just keeps getting fuller and more full and more full and it just keeps getting more packed and pretty soon people look at the fluorescent bulb, they don't know it's a fluorescent bulb, they just think it's like another uh, anchor pole and they just grab the pole and they start holding on themselves and pretty soon he's got several people holding on to this bowl and then it dawns on him, you know, I don't really have to visit the dumpster. When I get to my stop, I just have to let go. (laughs) He walked off the train. And as he was walking off the train, he thought to himself, you know, if that train comes to a sudden stop, those people are in for a rude awakening. Because what they think is anchored into the floor is not. And I think about that and I think about life. There's so many times in life and I think that there's a lot of people going through life that think they're anchored in. They think they're anchored into the floor of life, and they're not. They think they're anchored into the floor of eternity, and they're not. And they think they're anchored in, and they feel so secure, and they feel so certain, they feel so so brave that where they are in life is perfect, and that's where they should be. But if life comes to a screeching halt, or if life hits a bump, or if what happens is we go flying. They go flying. Because trust is only as good as the source it's anchored in. And in the faith, as Christians, we have anchored our life, we've anchored our eternity, we've anchored everything that we are, we've anchored it into Jesus Christ. And so any bump that comes along, any sudden stop, any, anything that might even derail our life, we're holding on to the secure, eternal being, God on the ground, Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn with me to John chapter 6 this morning as we continue our look at God on the ground, as we take a look at the work of Jesus Christ, and we take a look at who Jesus is, today we're going to see trust that transforms. Trust that transforms you, it transforms me, it transforms everyone who believes in Jesus Christ and he transforms us a certain way. And as we know, miracles in the gospel of John are not simply just miraculous things that Jesus did for no reason. The Gospel of John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, used the word sign for miracles. Now, it's translated miracles in our Bible, but 
It's about a sign. He wanted us to see Jesus as God's son. So it's with that that we see one of the biggest signs, one of the greatest signs, an incredible sign. Would you, would you stand with me as we read out of respect for the reading of God's word? We're going to start in chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for Jesus himself knew what he would do. This is important. Jesus wasn't asking because he didn't know what to do. Jesus was asking to test the faith of Philip. What should we do? Philip's been preaching. He's been part of the disciples. He's been traveling and preaching about Jesus being here, the Messiah being here. Philip? Do you really know what you're preaching about? Philip answered and said to him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that even that every one of them would have even a little. Now a denarii was a man's wage, a man's daily wage. So if you think about 200 denarii, that's like eight months of a man's salary. And he's saying eight months of a man's salary, Lord, isn't even enough for everybody to just have a little bit of food. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad, there's a boy here. He has five barley loaves, loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? <clears throat> a great picture, a little boy showing up. Here, I can help. Here, Jesus. But what are they? Then Jesus said, Make all the people sit down. Now there was much grass in this place, so the men sat down. In number, there were 5,000. Now, why were there only 5,000 men there? What about where were the women and the children? In biblical time, they, they only counted, when they counted, they counted heads of homes. So there were 5,000 men. You can assume their wives were with them and their children. There were twenty to 25,000 people gathered on this hillside. It's a pretty incredible sight. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to his disciples, and the disciples to those who were sitting down, and likewise the fish, as much as they wanted, as much as they wanted. This was, this was not, <clears throat> there's been some Bible scholars who want to say like, they want to discredit miracles, or discredit the signs. They want to say, this was a big sharing endeavor. Everybody shared their lunch, and everybody was full. No, Jesus performed a miracle. He took five loaves of bread and two fish, and he transformed it. It was a sign that he is God on the ground. Some say, wow, Jesus spiritually filled everybody on the hillside. They were so spiritually full, they weren't hungry anymore. No, no, no. Jesus physically filled them with food until each of them were full, powerful. There was so much left over when they were full that he and his disciples gathered up the fra fragments. He said, gather up the ones that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they, therefore, they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the signs that Jesus did, said, Tr this truly is the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force and make him the king, he departed again to the mountainside by himself alone. Incredible. Trust that transforms. You may be seated. If you're taking notes this morning, I would encourage you, trust that transforms. What can we gain from this account that you and I can apply to our lives today? Jesus deals with the disciples during this time. He deals with the people, but he's primarily teaching his disciples at this time a little bit about himself. What is something that you and I can apply to our lives today? Well, I would encourage you to write down that trust that transforms will test our faith. Trust that transforms will test our faith. Here we see Jesus ask the disciples, specifically Philip, he says, where shall we get some food? 
This was not a inquiry uh, and Jesus wondering what to do, wringing his hands, wondering how we're going to feed 20 to 25,000 people. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He was testing Philip and he was testing his disciples. In Mark's account, the disciples suggest that he should just let the people go into the town and get food for themselves. Man, what a great, <laughs> you got to love these guys, right? Now, this little seaside town, there was no way there was enough food in this town for 20 to 25,000 people. But what they're basically saying to Jesus is, it's not our problem. These people chose to follow you, Lord. They knew what they were doing. They should have brought food for themselves. See if they can go find some. Oh, man, that's rough, right? Every now and then, when you find yourself discouraged at your own humanity, just remember that those who were closest to Jesus, who walked with Jesus, were human enough to miss Jesus. They were human enough to not make the right choices. Philip suggests, well, maybe we should raise the money. But Lord, even eight months wages wouldn't be enough to feed all these people. What should we do? Andrew says, well, there's this little boy. He brought me his lunch. Got a few loaves of bread, a couple of fish. But I mean, like, what are we going to do with that, Lord? I mean, seriously, look at all these people. 25,000 people. Take half of Mishawaka. Fill them up on a hillside. That's where Jesus is. It's a pretty incredible thought, but Jesus was testing his disciples. Now, if Jesus will test the faith of his disciples... Jesus will test our faith as his disciples. I would encourage you to think about this for a second. Jesus does not test unbelievers. Jesus tests believers. Jesus tests the faith of those who have believed in him. Jesus is testing Andrew, or, uh, Philip. He's testing his disciples today in this passage. And Jesus will test our faith as well. Testing is not something that Jesus does to the world. Testing is something he reserves for believers. In fact, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5 says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience, when it ha has had its perfect work, uh, I'm sorry, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Nothing. So testing always grows us. Testing always educates us. Testing always transforms us. What Jesus does in this moment is Jesus is taking them through an impossible scenario. It's impossible for them to find food. The people could not go into the town and find food for themselves. <clears throat> they couldn't raise enough money to go even to, into other towns and buy enough food for themselves. There was no way that this little boy's lunch could pro provide food for themselves. And yet Jesus is going to feed them. He's going to fulfill their earthly need. What Jesus does in our own lives is he tests our faith. And there will be times in our life where things won't make any sense. It will be impossible. Impossible. Humanly speaking, impossible. It's not going to make sense. It doesn't work. I don't know how this is going to happen. But as God sustains us through that time, God grows our faith. God educates our faith. God transforms us on the inside, on the inside out. God changes us. Because Jesus is in the work of transformation. He gives you a new life, hence the name of our church. You are not what you, want, want, what you once were. You are who God is cre saving you and creating you to be. He's moving you towards a new creation. He is transforming you. We're all faced with different tests. I think of parents who, through different phases of their children's lives, they spend time in prayer, spend time in deep concern as they watch their children walk through different obstacles in life, academics, friendships, athletics, growing in the faith. And it's sobering for parents to take a step back and realize, yes, God has entrusted us with this child for this time, but the child is God's. Oh, sure, the child is ours, earthly speaking, but the child is God's. And that is, that is a testing time for parents. There are testing times as parents. There are testing times in our careers. As we use our careers, as we use our time for the Lord to be an influence for Jesus Christ, there are times on the job where we will face crisis, and there will be times where we will say, this doesn't make sense. It is impossible. 
But we know that with the Lord, anything is possible. And so, Lord, this is impossible. And I'm trusting that as you see me through this, that Christ, you're going to transform me. There are times in our health where, as I just experienced, you hear the doctor say there is something troubling here. It's a testing time. This doesn't make sense. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how this fits. But God grows us. So when we go through testing times, many times as believers, especially American Christians, we say, well, I'm living right. I'm dedicating to the Lord. Things shouldn't be bumpy for me. Things shouldn't derail. Things shouldn't come to a screeching halt. That is not true. If you need any further verification, read the book of Job. He loved the Lord and experienced great heartache. Test that, trust that transforms us. As we go through testing times in our lives, what we begin doing is stop, we stop asking, Lord, how can I get out of this? And we begin asking, Lord, what are, what are you doing in my life? What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to grow in? in my understanding of you and in my relationship with you? How do you want me to transform? I'm becoming somebody different through this experience. Trust that transforms. Trust is, it will be tested. I'd encourage you to write down number two. Trust that transforms is simple. Here's a little boy who recognizes the simplicity of hunger. It's a beautiful picture of just purity of heart. A little boy that seemed to somehow be connected to Andrew and must have overheard Jesus talking about <clears throat> getting some lunch for everybody or getting some dinner for everybody. And here's this little boy and he's like, hey, maybe Jesus can use this. Andrew brings it to Christ. Well, there's something about the simplicity of that act. It's just simple trust. It doesn't have to be complex. You don't have to parse every Greek word uh, word or know every single, every single theological, you know, standpoint on different points of scripture in order to have trust that's transforming your life. It's simple. Faith is not complex. It's, it's simple. I believe in Jesus. I trust he's transforming me. I'm spending time in his word and applying it to my life. I'm obeying his word. It's simple, like this boy. It doesn't have to be complicated. There's something about children that's just so pure. And when they exercise, exercise their faith, it's just so simple. I, in a similar way, I, I, I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, but sometimes children just from the back seat, they can just, from the back seat, can just throw beautiful things your direction. And I'll never forget one day I was driving with one of our daughters and, and I heard in the back seat, I was just focused on driving and I heard her in the back seat and she goes, oh, dad. I was like, what's that, kiddo? And she goes, she says, oh, dad, that man doesn't have a home. She was reading as she was going, uh, as we were going down the road, and she saw this man, and she was reading a sign. She goes, he doesn't have a home. Dad, can we help him? Dad, you can help him, can't you? Of course we can help. So pure. Children are just so pure, so simple. Your faith doesn't have to be complex. Simple faith can be used by God, and he can transform you from the inside out. Jesus will bless our simple faith. A little with God goes a long way. God is capable of multiplying anything in your, in your life. He is capable of multiplying your time. When you, by faith, give God just a small portion of your day, God can multiply your time throughout the rest of your day. When you give God just a small portion of your weekend, and you spend time worshiping with believers, just like you are today, God can multiply your time, and your weekend. When you give God just a small portion of your vacation, I did a funeral last Thursday right before I had surgery, and on Thursday I did this funeral for a gentleman, and his sister said this. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was great. She said this. She said, everywhere my brother went, whether he traveled for work or whether he traveled for leisure, wherever he was on Sunday morning, he found a church for his family to worship in, or he worshiped himself. What a great testimony. God can multiply your time. When you give to the Lord, he can multiply your time. God can multiply your influence when you by faith and trust Christ with your career and you see your job as more than a place to make a living, but a place to make a difference for Jesus Christ. And you recognize that people have been put around you, <clears throat> not as simple, uh, just 
simple uh, co-workers or employees, they've been put around you for, to influence them for Jesus Christ. What God can do in those moments is, as you invest your life into them, he can multiply your influence for them. God can multiply your resources. When you invest your finances into kingdom work, 90% of your income with God's blessing becomes so much more than 100% of your income on your own without God's blessing. You see, God is a God of multiplication and he can multiply just through simple faith. I think of something as simple as maybe you might choose to send a child to children's camp or send a child to youth camp. Have you thought about the impact of one life the impact of one life who trusts Jesus Christ as Savior. They are now in, in the hands of the Lord. They become a child of God. And maybe they grow up and then they marry someone that is a believer. And then they raise their children in the things of the faith. And then their children go to camp. And then their children are investing in the things of the Lord. And then they get married. And then they have children. And just by sending one child to camp, you can, you can impact hundreds. You can impact generations. Because a little with God goes a long way. And Jesus showed that. The simple faith of this little boy, God, Jesus multiplied it thousands and thousands of times over. Jesus does the same with us today. Trust that transforms. It will be tested. It is not complicated. It's simple. What else? I'd encourage you to write down number three. Trust that transforms is impactful. This multitude would have stayed all day long if Jesus would allow them to. These people knew that there was something special with Jesus. They had heard his disciples coming through their land, preaching about how the Messiah had come and how he was here. <clears throat> they had seen Jesus heal their sick and their diseased. He had watched this, they had watched this happen. These people didn't really care to go anywhere. If you think about it, these people were just perfectly content to be on that hillside. They had nowhere to be, nowhere to go. Back in this time, they learned uh, through listening. The average person of this day, they didn't have books. They didn't read books. Didn't have television. This week, the doctor told me, I don't want you to read. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to watch television. I don't want you to spend a lot of time on your phone. I was like, hello. <laughs> What's left? <laughs> Again, noticing that the tree out back kind of goes like this, around 3 p.m., if the wind hits just right. That's how people, that's how they lived back then, right? So when Jesus came through town, that was a big deal. They weren't going anywhere. They were impacted by Jesus. And they became greatly impacted by this little boy. Because Jesus used his lunch to multiply it thousands of times over. <clears throat> what was going on during this time is there was really oppressive Roman rule. So the Roman, like if you think about Jesus' time, the Roman soldiers were always they, it, the centurion and stuff like that. Like that was Roman rule. And then from the Jewish side, they had really crooked religious leaders. So the people were just kind of being crushed. And when Jesus came through town and he was healing their sick and they were hearing things proclaimed about him, what happened in those moments is people felt hope. Hope is powerful. Hope is, man, it, it, you can hang your whole life on hope. Just the hope that Jesus can do something. These people were hoping that Jesus would be the next king. These people were hoping that Jesus would deliver them from this Roman oppression they were praying that Jesus would deliver them from these crooked uh, religious leaders that were oppressing them. They saw Jesus as their hope. That's what Jesus does. He becomes hope in our hopeless situation. So he performs a sign. He demonstrates to them who he is. I am God on the ground, Jesus says. Jesus says he is the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for, the Christ. I am God in a body, he says, through his miracle. Now, this is the only miracle that is taught in all four Gospels. I think that's very important. 
because it became a sign that was so important that it marked these, these disciples in such an instrumental way. It transformed them. In that moment, the multitude wanted to take Jesus and they wanted to make him king immediately. How exciting would that have been for the disciples? They were for it. Absolutely. Let's get Christ set up and then they could be governors and rulers in the land of Israel and they, 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 were, they were all for it. <clears throat> but that's not what Jesus came for. Jesus didn't come for an earthly crown. Jesus came for the crown of eternity. And the crown of eternity was not obtainable without the cross. And that's very important for us as believers. We must understand that. Jesus could not have the crown without the cross. Oh, he could have had an earthly kingdom, but that's not what Jesus is here for. Jesus came to die on the cross and raised from the dead for our sins. He came for the earthly, or for the eternal kingdom, for the heavenly kingdom. That's what Jesus came for. He came to go to the cross to receive the crown for all of eternity. Now, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're told to compete for the crown. We're told that there are crowns that we will receive when we get to heaven. The crown of life. We're told that we will have different crowns that will be placed upon us and we will cast them at the feet of Jesus. Now, remember something. Jesus could not have the crown without the cross. And you and I in our lives cannot have our crowns without the cross. Jesus says, whoever desires to come after me, he says, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Our crowns in eternity will be directly tied to the crosses that we bear for Jesus Christ while we are here on this earth. If you find yourself carrying a cross, bearing a cross, and it feels too much for you, just remember what you are carrying. When you take it up every single day, you are not competing for anything earthly. It's not right here and right now that you will be rewarded. But as you take up that cross every single day, as you put it on and you keep going one more day with the Lord, one more day with the Lord, one more day with the Lord, you are setting up for yourself treasures in heaven that moth and rust cannot destroy. That crown that you are competing for will come through the cross that you bear here on this earth. Our crosses, it will, be, it will be imperative that we rely upon Jesus Christ to multiply our energy, multiply our time, multiply our resources, multiply our abilities, multiply our influence, and so much more. We will need Jesus Christ, the one who multiplied the, the bread and the fish by thousands. He will be relied upon to multiply in our lives so that we can carry our crosses and we can reach eternity and receive the crown. Receive the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Now don't misunderstand, this isn't earning your way to heaven. We get to heaven by trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. But as we follow Jesus Christ as our Lord, what happens is he transforms us on the inside and we compete for the crowns on the other side. We're setting up treasures over there, not right here. Whatever you're walking through, let Jesus impact the people around you. He'll impact your family. He will impact your neighbors. He's going to impact your coworkers. He's going to impact uh, everybody around you. You will, mul you, will, you will impact multitudes around you as you take up your cross and follow the Lord. I'd encourage you to write down, trust, that, trust in Jesus will transform you from the inside out. Trust in Jesus will transform you <coughs> Excuse me, from the inside out. <clears throat> Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy about himself at this moment. Jesus is showing the people that he is, he is the God-man. <clears throat> he is the one who came into existence. He is the eternal God. He is 100% God, and he is 100% human. And Jesus is showing this in this sign. Just as Jesus is feeding this multitude in the middle of nowhere, he is showing himself that he was the one who, when Moses was taking the people through the wilderness in the middle of nowhere, Jesus was the one. He provided the manna every day. He provided the quail every day. Just like in, in those times, as, as God fed the people in the wilderness, Jesus is feeding the people in the wilderness on this hillside. Jesus is giving this. This is a picture of salvation. 
Jesus calls himself later in this chapter the bread of life. You know, just as providing bread for these people was able to sustain them for a moment, when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, he provides sustenance for your soul for all of eternity. While food was provided, don't forget, the people had to take it, they had to receive it, and they had to eat it. It's a picture of salvation. Jesus himself he offers, he says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and we've fallen short of God's glory. Here's the deal. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned somewhere in our life. We've all fallen short of God's standard of holiness. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our payment for that sin is eternal separation from God for all of eternity. That is our reality. Because of our sin nature, we are separated from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, even that while we were sinners, Christ came and he died for us. Jesus loved us so much that we see this right now. He's living that sinless life. He's showing people who he is. He will go to the cross, die on the cross, pay for the sins of humanity. He will raise from the dead. And those who, are, who believe in him, the offer is made available, just like those people on the hillside. The bread was made available. They had to take it, receive it, and they had to eat it. The offer is made available to you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, to believe in him, to have faith in him. And he becomes the bread of life for your soul. It says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. You will have the bread of life. You will be sustained for now and for eternity. Your soul will be kept by God. At the moment of salvation, Jesus begins a work inside of you. He begins a new life. Can we go to that? Can I show that uh, worldview pyramid, Jake? Thank you. When we invite Jesus into our heart, I want you to think about something here. We don't simply just invite Jesus into... Uh, we are inviting Jesus into our life. He's, he's paid for our sins and we're accepting that free gift of salvation. But I want you to understand something. Jesus coming into our heart is more than just an emotional feeling. Please see this for a second. Your heart is comprised of your worldview. Your heart is comprised of what you believe. Your heart is comprised of what you value. And it is revealed in your behavior. And so as Christians, what happens is when we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, he begins a transforming work. Jesus begins a transformation in our hearts, and he begins transforming the way we see things. We start seeing things through God's lens, the way we're supposed to see them. We start believing what the Bible has to say about different issues in life. And we say, well, okay, so if the Bible says this about my marriage, I'm going to believe it. If the Bible says this about uh, raising my children, I'm going to believe it. If the Bible says this about my friendships, I'm going to believe it. If it says this about my vocation and how I work, I'm going to believe it. It changes your beliefs. And then as it changes your beliefs, you start valuing things different. You say, well, if I believe what the Bible has to say about this for my marriage, then I'm going to put some different values in my life. I'm going to put some different values in my life on my parenting. I'm going to have different values in my life on my uh, career. I'm going to have different values in my life in my friendships. I'm going to value things differently, and then it becomes visible in our behavior. You see, a lot of times in Christianity, here's what people want to do. Christians do this. They trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and then what they try to do is they try to conform. They see other Christians around them, and they try to conform to be like them. That is not what Jesus is intending for your life. He doesn't want you to look like other people. He doesn't want you to conform. Jesus wants you to transform. Co conforming ourselves is trying to change our behavior, but our worldview and our values and our beliefs never change. But we look like this, but inside we're still off. Jesus wants us to, conf he wants us to transform our hearts. We do that by renewing our minds, Romans tells us. We change our heart. As Jesus transforms us on the inside, it becomes revealed on the outside. Jesus is about the work of transformation. These disciples would never be the same. The people on the mount would never be the same. They would be transformed because of their encounter with Jesus Christ. They would see him differently. What did they say? They said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. They knew 
This is the God man. That's who we've been waiting for. It transformed, it began a transforming work in their hearts. Jesus wants to transform the way you believe, the way you think, the way you process information, the way you act, and the way you live. What Jesus wants to do is he wants to transform you at the core of who you are. That's what Jesus wants to do. Trust will transform you from the core. Jesus transformed the disciples in this miracle by teaching them about himself. Jesus transformed this offering from this little boy that was blessed for a blessing for the whole crowd, the whole multitude, the whole thousands of people. Jesus transformed the view of himself by this multitude. And Jesus will transform your life when you trust him with everything that you have, everyone in your life, every situation in your life. He will transform you. Trust that transforms. It will be tested. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just simple trust in Jesus. It's impactful to, or, to others around you. And it will transform you from the inside out. We enjoy road trips in our family. We like a, a nice road trip. We had a couple good ones last year. And we're already in the middle of planning a couple of good ones for this year. Lord willing. Uh, we'll be able to have some fun on some vacation together, and uh, we always like them. But, you know, some people are very competitive on road trips. I don't know if you're one of those people. I, I don't get that way, but some people are. Do I get that way? I don't know. Nah, I'm not competitive. See, Jamie, she'll ver verify. But some people like to, like, how long can we go? How long can we go before we pull over, right? Like, can we get an hour? Some of you are like, an hour? Try driving with a four-year-old. Okay, an hour. Can we get an hour? Can we get two hours? Can we get three hours? Can we get four hours? And then, then and like, if you know where you're going, you're like, hey, maybe, hey, this is where I want to get to. Let's get to this stop where they have this restaurant and then this gas station, and we can just get it all tied into one. Kids can, uh, they can stretch their legs, get it all taken care of in one stop. <laughs> Whew, simple enough. Well, Imagine, if you will, you pull over on a stop and kids run in to use the restroom and they're grabbing something to eat and you're getting there at the gas pump and you're like, hmm, well, diesel sure looks a whole lot more economical than this unleaded over here. Like, I'm not paying unleaded cost. Not when this beautiful diesel here looks nice and economical for me. And you grab the diesel nozzle and you plug that in your van and you just start pumping. You get in that car and you're like, yeah, we saved money. It's going to be a good trip. I don't care how much money you saved. Pretty soon, if not immediately, your van, your SUV, your car, whatever you're driving is just going to be, it's going to start chugging. And it may even just shut down. Why? Because your car is built for unleaded and you're trying to force diesel into it. It's not what your car was made for. A lot of people in the Christian faith, similarly, are trying to force themselves. They're trying to force transformation the wrong way. Christians are saying, I want to be transformed, but my way, Lord. I want to be transformed, but I want to do it my way. And I don't want to go through this, and I don't want to go through that, and I don't want to do this. And I, you know what that is? That is, putting un, that is like putting diesel in your life and you're built for unleaded. That is what you are doing. And sure enough, would you believe there are a lot of Christians that at best their life is just chugging along, just jerking along, and at worst they are derailed. They are on the side of the road, broken down, because they are trying to force transformation their way. And Jesus says transformation comes his way. We transform our lives. Jesus transforms our life through trust in him. We trust him with our eternity by believing in Jesus Christ as our savior, that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead for our sins. We trust in Jesus Christ with our everyday life and we put ourselves in his hands every day and we trust him with each and every day. That's how we do it. And we let Christ transform us on the inside out. We let him transform our worldview and he, we let him transform our beliefs and our values. And we let him do that. But if we force it and we resist and we reject and we push back on the Lord, what happens is we get hiccups. Sometimes we break down. 
trust that transforms. What kind of trust are you exercising in Jesus today? With every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around, maybe you're here today and you'd like to affirm what you believe about Jesus in your life. Would you go to him in faith believing, in the quietness of your own heart, would you just say, dear Jesus, I believe in you as the eternal son of the living God who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Please come into my life and save me. Again, that's dear Jesus, I believe in you as the eternal son of the living God who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Please come into my life and save me. If you prayed that prayer this morning, maybe you prayed it online with us, would you just, would you just raise your hand and just say, hey, Pastor Michael, I affirmed what I believe about Jesus Christ today. Thank you. Believing, friend. Where's your trust? Where does it lie? Can I ask? Are you exercising simple trust in the Lord? Spend a moment. Before we pray, before we sing, before we go pick up our children, take this moment with Christ. Ask him to transform you. Maybe there's an area in your life you just need to give some simple trust to him in. Say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm willing to do it your way. I give it to you. Maybe there's an area in your life where you feel like you're not transforming. Maybe it's your worldview, your values, your beliefs. Ask the Lord to transform your heart as you spend time in Scripture and live it out in your life. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together, to hear from your word, to study the life of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for his perfect life on this earth, his perfect sacrifice on the cross, the way he conquered death and hell and his resurrection, the way he is worthy of our trust of every facet of our lives. Lord, may we live the trust. And Lord, I pray that you would transform us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we respond in worshipful song?
will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Well, thank you for braving the cold, for shoveling out this morning. I hope you found it a blessing. I hope you found it a warm experience, not only temperature-wise in the auditorium, but with the body of believers around you. Thank you for those who joined us online this morning. We trust the service bless you. Would you pray the benediction with us today as we're dismissed? Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Pray with me. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for joining us today.